Uh, looks like it is 10 o'clock and about time to get started with our webinar this morning. Uh, I'm sure other people will probably be popping in as well, but I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Elizabeth Hoffman and I am the director for the South Dakota MLS program through the School of Library and Information Management at Emporia State University. My office is in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and I am uh, I work with students here as they are earning their degrees. But my experience working at Emporia State, which I've been at for about a year, is not what we're talking about this morning. Instead, we're going to talk about some of my experiences previous to this position. I worked in the public library here in Sioux Falls, Sioux Land Libraries, for about 14 years before coming to Emporia State. And in those 14 years, I spent about a decade of it in the Youth Services Division. Uh, in the Youth Services Division, I was one of two traveling storytellers. So I had the opportunity to go out and do story times at all of our 13 branches, at daycare centers throughout the area. Uh, I did a lot of outreach and then also took part in planning some of our summer reading, uh, teen programs. I did a lot of teen programs, a lot of school age programs. When I first started in youth services, I had been working in the reference department before that, and I had interviewed for an internal transfer. And the two questions that came up were, can you sew? We need someone who can make puppets, and I, I can sew a little bit. And can you do story times for infants? Birth to about two years. And I had never done a LAPSIT program before, but I felt pretty confident that I could. And that's, that's what I told them. And I was able to take on that position. So I became the lead storyteller for all of the LAPSIT programs that took place in our library system. I would do between four and five LAPSITs a week and had the opportunity to talk with parents the way that our program was structured, and I know a lot of infant story times are structured in a, in a similar way, is we would read stories and do, do rhymes, different bouncing activities for a, about 15 to 20 minutes, as long as you can really keep a very young child engaged with that kind of thing. And then we would also have a open play time at the end of of story time that kids could play with toys, interact with their parents. Parents would have the opportunity to chat with each other. And what I learned doing that LAPSIT program was that a lot of the parents in our community were looking for other people to talk with. They wanted to find out if their child was was developing the way other children were. They wanted to know tri uh, tricks and tips, things about easier ways to parent, and they wanted to just socialize, just have a chance to talk. So it started with a 15-minute playtime, and I would say by the time I, uh, I had moved into a different position, some of my laps at story times were running an hour long after the actual story time with parents chatting and and it was a great opportunity for me to sit down with a group of parents and talk about what it was that they wanted from the library. And I took advantage of that. I would stay in the room for some of that playtime and talk with them about what books they would like to see in our story times, what activities they were doing at home with their children, and how we could help facilitate their their role in their children's literacy. What I found when I was talking with those parents was a number of them would tell me that they didn't read to their children at home. They brought their kids to the story times at the library. They felt that literacy was important and they knew they needed to do something to help their children learn to read, even at that very young age. But they weren't comfortable reading a storybook out loud to their children. They felt that they didn't have an engaging voice, that when they sang they were off key, that they 
weren't able to to make the silly noises that I could make in story time. And their kids would get distracted and not want to sit through the book. And what's the point of trying to read to your kid if they're not sitting through the whole book? I heard these things over and over from parents as I talked to them during these story time play groups. And I realized that I could do story time. This was, this was something I was very good at doing. At least it felt like I was pretty good at it. But I needed to do more to help parents read to their children at home. And I needed to help them get the skills so that they would be more comfortable taking, taking those rhymes and stories home as well. Because a half an hour a week isn't going to teach children how to read. So I reached out to our other traveling storyteller who was a very experienced storyteller with a lot of, a lot of knowledge on how to engage parents. And, and I asked her what I should be doing to help teach parents these skills. And she was really excited. She, uh, she started teaching me more about Every Child Ready to Read from the American Library Association, about the importance of teaching parents with tips and tricks throughout story time to help them become better, better at reading stories at home. And I, I was really excited. I started doing my own research, finding out more. I ran into a lot of different resources about teaching parents those skills. And, and I really felt like it brought a lot more to my story time, to be able to explain why we were doing those rhymes, why we sang songs, why it was important to read out loud to your child when you were at home. And I continued doing that for a number of years, but one of those things that kind of tickled in the back of my mind was that I wasn't doing a whole lot for the parents who weren't able to get to story time. I could teach the parents who were in story time, but those parents who maybe their work schedules didn't permit them to do that, I wasn't able to help them develop those skills. So. I, I started looking at some of the, the things that other libraries were doing, and I I'm, came across a thousand books before kindergarten, which I'm sure a lot of you have come across as well. And it is a great program, but everywhere I saw it listed as, as a great program for a single branch or a small library. And, and so I was a little bit nervous about trying to implement something like that in our 13 branch system. Also, I, I felt like maybe it wasn't my place to bring in those kinds of things. And, and so I just, I kept reading about it and keeping my notes. Uh, during that time, I also started taking a, a uh, more active role in the summer reading program. And working with that summer reading program, I saw that there were, our program was set up for ages three through the end of fifth grade. And I saw that there were a lot of uh, parents who were contacting us asking if there was anything for that younger age group. And that, that other traveling storyteller who I worked with, she was excited about starting something for that younger age group and she started a summer program for them. And we got to talking about it and I said, you know, those kids aren't in school. They need something the rest of the year round as well. Uh, maybe it is time we, we look at launching that thousand books before kindergarten program. So I, I went to a webinar like all of you are doing today and I learned a little bit more about how their library was implementing the program. And it wasn't going to work that way for us because I didn't have the same resources and the same, the same community as they did. But I learned a lot that I was able to take and then adapt to my own library system. And I'm hoping that's what I can do for you this morning is give you the resources to, to start to develop your own library program. So that's kind of where I'm coming from and a little bit of my background. I'm going to share my screen with you now and I hope that everybody's able to see it. Uh, this is about how we started the Thousand Books Before Kindergarten program at Siouxland Libraries and what it is that, that we did to make that work in our multi-branch system. A lot of this is very adaptable to a smaller branch. 
I transferred to one of our smaller locations and was able to work with them to create a better approach to a rural library. So our library system here in Sioux Falls has about 200,000 people who live in the area. About 180,000 of them live in the city itself. We also have several rural branches and smaller communities. And I was at the downtown branch for a number of years and then transferred out to our rural west locations and was in a town of about 1,200 people. So it gave me a, a good perspective on how to make something work in a big city and how to make some well, medium-sized city and how to make something work in a small town. So the first question I knew I had to answer when I was proposing this to our administration was why 1,000 books? Where does that number come from? Why is that so important with, with uh, developing literacy skills? And the first thing that I learned was that there were no studies that said you needed to read a thousand books. Uh, that makes it a little hard to convince your administration that this is great because I didn't have any hard studies. What I found was that MemFox had 10 read aloud commandments. And commandment number two was to read at least three stories a day. It may be the same story three times. Children need to hear a thousand stories before they can begin to learn to read, or the same story a thousand times. This is just a quote she uses. It, it's, it's something she, she says. It's not anything based on hard facts. So why was a thousand books the number that we should go with for our reading program? Well, what I found when I looked a little bit deeper was that a thousand books is a Goldilocks number. It's not too high and it's not too low. It's just right. A thousand books is very easy to accomplish for a family that reads three books a day for one year or one book a day for three years. Most kids like to read a story before bed. When you start reading to them, they really enjoy it. Reading one or two books seemed like a pretty normal number when I was talking to parents. So it was a little bit of a stretch to ask them to read three books a day, but we were trying to encourage them to read more at home. So that was, that was a good goal. We also knew that there were families that weren't reading at home at all. I knew that based on my, my conversations with a lot of our story time parents. And so we needed to encourage them just to start reading at home. One book a day for three years would help you finish this program. So if you registered for the thousand books program when your child was two, you could finish it by the time they started kindergarten by just reading one book a day. Those numbers were important because it made that seem very manageable. But I knew that it would help me secure some funding, help me get approval to move the program forward if, if I had some hard facts. So I started looking for what do studies say? And what you find out when you start to look at studies on early literacy is that it's important to read to children. Go back so you guys can see that. It's important to read to children. You need to read out loud to children to help them develop literacy skills. Here are some very, uh, the quote here from the Colorado Libraries for Early Literacy is a great quote on that I have used many times when promoting this program. The single most important activity for building the knowledge required for eventual success in reading is reading aloud to children. You can search any database of scholarly journals and find support for this quote. There are a lot of articles out there that support reading, helps reading aloud to children, helps them learn to read. It's it's very easy to find that support. Uh, another easy to support position is that libraries are in a unique position to reach and educate parents on early literacy. Parents come into the library, we're a free resource. Uh, we have lots of books available. We have professionals on staff that can help you learn the skills you need to read to your children to help recommend a book that's going to engage them, something that they're going to be interested in, to give you 
support when you need it, just a friendly face to encourage you to keep reading. Libraries are, are in a good position to do that. We're a part of the community. We do outreach. We go into daycares. We go into uh, park events. And we have that chance to promote what we do and the importance of literacy in ways that other resources don't necessarily have. We also tend to have more flexibility than, than a teacher would or a, a school would to, to work with parents, to sit down and talk with them for a little while. So that was, that was an important thing is that we are there to support them and that parents are really a child's first teacher. That's another important thing that studies say the most important teacher that those very young children have are their parents. That's who they're learning from. They're modeling their behavior based on what their parents do. So with those hard facts, uh, the, the research has shown that these are definitely things that are true. It made it a little bit easier for me to, to put together a program that would work for our system and for me to promote it with our administration. Like I said, you can find all sorts of support for those just, just by searching any database. So the next step in getting our administration to approve the program was to come up with what exactly we were going to do. How was it that we were going to promote it? How much was it going to cost? How much uh, staff time were we going to have to devote to this? Training, other things like that. I initially proposed starting this program with just one of our branches and trying it as a on a trial basis, see how it went, and, and then stretching it out to our other locations. Uh, we, we decided against doing it that way and instead opened it up to everyone at all of our locations. But it is a little daunting to start something new in, in a bigger setting, so that's why I proposed it that way. We did start with a small group of staff who had young children and having them try the program to see how manageable it was for a parent to do at home. Uh, we, we encouraged them to read to their children at home and, and to be a part of what we were doing. So I, I was very fortunate in that I had a, a young child at the time. He was 12 months old when we we're trying this out as, as staff members. And I was able to do that. And I found that it was, it was actually a lot of fun for me, but I do enjoy reading at home. So it was nice to hear the feedback from, from other people as to how I could encourage them to continue on once they got started. So what we decided was that we needed something to encourage people to register right away. And it needed to be a big enough gift that they would be excited to sign up. Something that we could take when we did outreach events and show people so that they would come into the library and register for the program. Or that we could hold up in front of our story times and say, hey, don't forget to register and get your free gift from the library. With a limited budget, uh, when I first proposed this program, we were, we were looking at a very small budget, just printing is about how much money we had. I had to try to come up with some ideas for inexpensive registration gifts. So we knew we needed a reading log. That was a necessity because we needed some way for parents to document the reading that they were doing at home and to, to come back to the library and let us know more about that. I really wanted to include a book bag for every child so that they would have a place that they kept their library books and could bring back and forth. I also find that library book bags, the, the reusable shopping bags that you can order through many different places. We ordered ours through CSLP uh, for, for the ones with the cute logos for summer reading programs. Uh, those book bags are a great way to advertise the library. It's got the library's logo on it, it's, or it has some sort of reading related thing that other people would see and be encouraged to come and sign up for the program. We put together our own reading guide for parents because like I said, a lot of parents were nervous about reading aloud to their children. 
and it was important that we gave them the skills that they needed in order to complete the program. So we did a one-page flyer that we tucked into their bag that gave some tips and tricks for reading out loud to young children. Information like, your child can wander away from the book. They're still listening and they're still getting something out of the story. Your, your child might want to read the same book over and over again. That's a great way for them to learn the sounds of words. Saying nursery rhymes with your child is, a, is an important uh, practice at home because it helps them hear rhymes. Those kinds of short little statements that helped parents begin reading at home. Here in our area, we had access to the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. Uh, our County United Way provides that for all of the, the children in our in our area so we took it as an opportunity to promote the imagination library and we tucked in the information into their bag with about that and then the big stretch the one that we wanted to do but we weren't sure if we were going to be able to make it happen was to include an easy reading book so everyone would be able to build their home library with a gift from the from the Sealand libraries we were very fortunate in that we were able to do all of those things. The very first one was our reading log. There's a lot of different styles of reading logs out there, but I wanted to design something that was unique to our program that we were doing. And I wanted it to include as many of those early literacy skills as we could. So I, I had a page about the program about why it was important to read a thousand books to your child, uh, who could take part, how do you keep track of the books, all of those things. I also wanted the book printed in black and white because I wanted it to be a coloring book. I wanted something that children could engage with, with their parents, that it would be fun to take it out, to make it your own, an individual book, so it would look different for every child. Uh, so I, I printed everything in black and white. I worked with a, a terrific graphic designer that uh, works for the city and he, he really helped me out on putting these things together. I, I don't have the skill to put that all together, just, just ideas in the back of my head, I suppose. I wanted everything to be animal themed. So we had a lot of animals on our, on our promotional materials because I felt like children could really relate to those and they're easy to color in. I, I included a page at the beginning and the end of the log that was an about me page. On the first page, on the, at the very beginning, they'd fill it out before they read the, their thousand books. And at the end, they'd fill it out again. And then parents could keep that journal. It would become a keepsake that they could, they could look back on. And in our reading log, we included lines for every single book the child read so that parents could write in what books they were reading. For me, part of the fun of the program was that I could look back on what my child had read during the course of that time. And a lot of the parents who, who had been part of that initial group with me felt the same way, that it was really fun to see how their interests changed on how you focused on a specific topic because that's what they were really into at the time. So that's the way we designed this. But we knew that that was asking a lot for some parents. So we did let them know that they didn't have to write in every single line. They could just do a check mark or an X, whatever worked best for them as they went through. Every time they reached 100 books, there, would be a, there was a page that included some sort of early literacy activity, a nursery rhyme that the parents could say, with the child and a coloring page so that they could practice their, their writing skills, uh, those kinds of activities all the way through the book. So that's how we designed our initial log. We looked at a lot of other options as we were putting these together. Some of our other logging options that we considered were coloring logs, like we had done with the reading program, where every time a child completed a book, they would color in a shape and, 
and when they reached the end of that, they could turn in their log. Uh, I know that based on some feedback from some of the parents doing the program, that is what the library is looking at going to now and giving the option between the two different types of logs. With the coloring log, we felt like it would be a better option to do smaller numbers of books. You wouldn't want to put all 1,000 books on one log. Instead, you would do maybe 50 or 100, whatever you decided the best number to have parents stop back into the library at would be. There was app-based logging. We actually did implement app-based logging in the beginning through Read Squared. We found that not very many parents wanted to take part in logging their reading that way. They seemed to enjoy having that paper log in their hands to work with, but there were a few parents who did do the program that way, and it was good to be able to reach them as well. I actually did mine in the app. I used the Thousand Books app, and I really appreciated having the, the ability to just scan the, the ISBN number on the back of the book and have it record in our app so that when I was looking at what my child had read over the course of the time, I could just scroll through and see all those neat covers. Uh, another, another option that we talked about was wall charts, something you could hang at home and go ahead and X off as you got through. It'd have to be a fairly large poster to fit all 1,000 books on it and it would be a little bit cumbersome to bring back and forth to the library so that was why we decided not to do that with our thousand books program but we did at the same time have several daycares ask how they could promote this program when we were first coming out with it how they could promote it to the parents in their area and how they could take part in something similar so we did create wall charts for daycare centers to use. And every time they reached 100 books, we would have them turn in their chart and receive a special story time visit. One of our storytellers would go out and visit the daycare and bring a special story time to celebrate their accomplishment. And a gift basket that included a few donated items that we had received at the library, some donated books uh, that we would give to the classroom to add to their classroom libraries. Those are just the ideas that we threw around. I am sure there are a lot of other options out there. I think that there are some really creative people and I would love to hear other, other logging ideas. Uh, maybe, maybe a jar with beads in it. I don't know, every time you finish a book, you get a bead or those might be a little small for young children, but something like that, I don't know, whatever, whatever works best for your community. So, as I said at the beginning, the reason I felt like we really needed the Thousand Books program at Siouxland was because we needed to engage more families in, in reading with their children. And we wanted those families to come back into the library on a regular basis to chat with the librarians, to find out how they were doing, how we could support them. We were really hoping to have a good communication between the families and the staff at the library. So in order to do that, we needed to come up with reasons for them to stop in. We put together some, some very simple, very inexpensive prizes for children to pick up when they completed each 100 books, broke that 1,000 up into a smaller number. Uh, we had a sticker, that's, that's what we started with. Every time you reached 100 books, you came in, you showed us your log, you got a sticker. Most of the kids like to put their sticker inside their log. Some of them like to wear it. Uh, it, was, it was very simple. Gave you a chance to ask the child, what was your favorite book that you got to read during this time? Uh, to encourage them to keep reading, help them pick out some new books. It was, it was a lot of fun and a great way to engage the families. Like I said earlier, I actually transferred to one of our smaller locations while we were in the process of getting this program up and running. And at that smaller location, I was able to, to start an all-star reader program for our thousand books. So when a child finished a hundred books, I, I had some nice little stars like I have over on the corner of the screen, or on the side of the screen here, that we would write the child's name in and we would move it up the wall. And when they got to the very top, their 1,000 books, they were an all-star reader. And they could 
bring in their family and friends and show off where they were on our wall of all star readers. It was a lot of fun. I hung it low enough that the children were able to move their stars up, uh, but we kept it in an area so that it wouldn't get played with all the time. It was it was a special event for families. Uh, most of the time they'd come in before story time in order to turn in their log, they'd show up early so that they could move their star up the wall before story time started. That way when all of their friends showed up for story time, they could talk about how well they had done in their reading. We also wanted to have a finisher prize. When we first started the program, we didn't have anything set up, but as we evolved with, with the prizes and our funding, we decided that every child who finished the program would get to choose a brand new book of their own to keep. So we also received some funding to help come up with some other prizes as they went through the program. So each 100 books, they got a sticker. At a 200, so two, four, six, and eight, they received a prize to help support early literacy skills at home. One of the prizes was sidewalk chalk so that they could practice their writing skills. Uh, they received bubbles so that they could practice that, that uh, sound, the sound effects of hoo 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 and things like that to, to practice their, their speech skills. Uh, they received a nursery rhyme, a song CD. It was a short little CD to, to practice their singing. And, and those were some of our options that we came up with. We were able to get those prizes for relatively inexpensive prices, so that really helped stretch our budget. And then we staggered them in order of least expensive to most expensive, so children who were more invested in the program got bigger prizes as they went through. So some of those prizes came in as little as 25 cents a piece, and I think the maximum prize for those in, uh, price for those in between those those smaller prizes was about fifty cents a piece, and might have been a dollar with that CD that we gave them. Uh, we also gave them Play-Doh to encourage imaginative play at home, and and to encourage parents to to sit down with their child and play pretend. But. When I initially started proposing the thousand books before kindergarten in our library system, we had a year where there was no budget increase. In fact, we were looking at ways to cut our budget. So it really was a difficult time to be bringing that program to our community. So I needed to come up with some ways to, to fund the program that weren't going to come out of the library budget. So I, I was a part of the summer reading planning group and had access to all of our leftover summer reading prizes. I was able to dig through all of those and put together some of those reading bags, some of those browsing bags that, that are so much fun to give out. We had a fair number of those from previous years. They were all sorts of different designs, so children could pick out whatever design they wanted, all sorts of colors, things like that. So we were able to have, have those browsing bags that I felt were so important. I also ran a book drive for our public library system. And the book drive was targeted at school-aged children. It tied in with uh, our tutoring program that taught tutoring during the summer, did reading tutoring during the summer. So as a part of that, we would frequently get board books and very young picture books donated that we didn't have anything to do with. They, they were paperbacks, so we didn't want to add them to our collection. Uh, some of the board books were a little more worn. So I started dividing out and saving those books so that we would have prizes to hand out or registration uh, prizes to hand out when, when children signed up for the program. Stickers, we could print our own and just use the Avery sticker sheets. Uh, that's what our initial plan was. And, and so there was some printing cost. Another idea that we had for a very low cost prize idea was special events and to do some sort of congratulatory story time for the, the children who finished, uh, parachute play, something along those lines something extra special, but wouldn't cost the library 
very much to, to put on. And also recognition, which it is amazing how far simple recognition programs can go in encouraging people to take part in something like this. So you can do a certificate, something you print off from, from your basic printer, or just every child who finishes gets a sheet of paper that says you completed a thousand books. And that can be very exciting. Uh, I had the all-star reader chart where I recognized every child as they completed each 100 books and they climbed up the wall. That was a great way to support that. One of our other staff members came up with the idea to post a picture on Facebook every time a child finished. They had some cute little signs made up that they could hold up that said, uh, I completed a thousand books. And with parent, parental permission, we were able to post those. Not only was it a great way to recognize the child, it was a good way for us to continue to promote the program throughout the years. Uh, parents whose children were posted would then like or share that post and other parents would be excited about the program and come in and register. So it, it kind of worked two ways. It worked as an advertising system and as a recognition. We did have those initial expenses with putting together the, the reading logs and those stickers and just those printing expenses. So I started looking for local grants. I didn't need a very big grant to get started, so that was helpful when I was looking around. I applied for a Walmart community grant. If you have a Walmart in your community, they, they tend to do small grants for programs like this, something that supports education, that supports early literacy. So that was, that was a real benefit to us. We were able to do those initial printing runs on a $500 grant from Walmart, which we were very appreciative of. As far as those local resources go, once the program started to come together and our staff was getting excited about it and our administration was getting excited about it, we were better able to promote it to other people in our community who had grant opportunities available. We had a local group that stepped forward and donated money to buy each child an easy reader book so that we could have that in their initial registration packet. And, and that was really exciting because that was one of our goals. And to be able to start the program with that was, was absolutely wonderful. They also really wanted us to be able to brand our, our reading bags. So they, they also provided the funding to print brand new browsing bags for children so that they could have one that had that thousand books logo. Another great way to advertise the program because that thousand books bag was sitting in someone's house. They showed it to their family. Uh, maybe they're taking it out in the community. People are seeing it, asking about what exactly it is. So it, it again worked two ways. It was a prize and it was also a great way for us to advertise. I found that once the program was up and running, people were excited about what we were doing. And the more excited they became about what we were doing, the more they wanted to help us out. So we were able to secure more funding. That's how we were able to get those smaller prizes in the in-between prize levels, those 200 levels, and able to support all of our goals with the program. So I had a couple of resources that I used quite heavily as we were putting together the program. We had the Thousand Books Before Kindergarten website that we used, memfox.com. And then there was a blog that I, I found very helpful that had some good research tools, tiny tips for library fun, blogspot.com, uh, 1,000 Books Before Kindergarten. It was really a, a good way for me to start my initial research. So I am going to stop sharing right now because I want to talk to you a little bit about the exciting prize that we were able to, to put together at the very end. So like I said, as we got going with the program, initially we were going to use donated books, which would have been a wonderful way to keep our budget down and, and encourage uh, children to continue reading and parents to continue reading at home. We had some very nice donations and, and I think that would have worked out great, but instead we were able to, to purchase a, a nicer book for every child who completed the program. And actually we purchased a number of different books so that they could choose their, their books. 
So this is the one that my son received. It's a classic fairy tale collection. It's a pretty, pretty substantial sized book here. And I have to say, this book is very well loved. Uh, you can see it's, it's falling apart because we've been reading it for the last five years. But it has great story, it has great stories, easy to read. And what I really loved about this one was that at the end of each story, it had a guide for parents to, to talk with their child about the book. So that's what made this one really fun. We also did some of the five minute stories that you can get from Disney and from Nickelodeon books, uh, the, the compilation books that have about eight to 10 stories in them. And, and they run between five and $10. We were able to get them through a book vendor so that we could get the discount. That was really helpful in, in bringing down our budget a little bit. And with those, we ordered, like I said, we ordered a number of different titles. So this was the one that came home at our house because we love fairy tales at our house. But I know that there are people who really love to read Disney Junior books and they were excited for the opportunity to have those books. Uh, when we first started, parents and children saw the, the wide range of books they got to choose from and, and it was really exciting they wanted to know how they could earn more than one book. And so we decided for our system, every parent and child would be able to, every child would be able to complete the program once per year. We, we had parents who were finishing the program in just a handful of months. I was, I was really impressed with how many books they read in such a short amount of time. But for our budgeting reasons, we could only let them finish the program once a year. But that meant that if you started with your infant, you could continue reading with them for five years and receive five different books at the end of the program and have a collection of your thousand books. We, we gave out the same easy reader at the beginning of every, every sign up. We would let them re-sign up and give them a new packet if they wanted it, but most parents opted out of the easy reader at the beginning because they already had a copy of that one at home. They were mostly excited about the opportunity to, to get that collection of books at the, at the very end. Another uh, neat idea that came from one of my coworkers was a kickoff event when we first launched the, the Thousand Books program. She put together a a reading fair where we had activities, we had story times, we had a really fun parachute play day, and all sorts of wonderful activities going on that were inexpensive for the library to do, but a great way for us to promote the program. And in order to keep interest in the program as we continued on, because it has been in place for about seven years, six, six years maybe now, and and you need to keep promoting as you're going through because it's a year round program. We don't have that initial jumping point like you do with a summer reading program. So every year around the same time we were launching summer reading, we would do a kickoff event again and promote the program, register families, have different uh, organizations in the community come in and set up a table to promote their activities that were literacy based just a really great way to to engage families and and get more from it so that is that is an introduction to how we started our thousand books program at siouxland libraries and i i was just wondering if there are any questions from anyone else any ideas that you have oh a copy of the the record that we were using the the log. It's just right over here in my drawer. Let me just. I have, I have the initial uh, log that we made. This was our prototype. And that's the one that I keep in my desk. It's partially because it's a uh, bond memories. And, and so ours was structured a lot like this where you could go through and write each individual book as you went through. And you can see where there were parents who, who were a little bit uh, concerned about having to write every single title in. So we did encourage them to just put a check mark in. We have some cute little 
animals at the bottom of each page. And then here's our first activity that we had at 100 books. So Baba Black Sheep, color in the page, just some fun, fun things like that. And then here is the end. When you finished a thousand books, you got your certificate that was already printed and then the end of the book. And then over here, we had our All About Me page again. Uh, with those, this is my prototype. And I really, uh, really liked my, my prototype copy. But uh, we were able to increase our budget a little bit with some of those donations and instead did a spiral bound version, which you could just flip open and keep open to the page that you were working on. You didn't have to, uh, didn't have to keep it like that. All right, the last URL, it's a pretty long one. Let me see if I can copy that for you here. Like I said, this is where I got a lot of my research that was able to support the program and, and encouraged people to take part in that. And then my other resources, I'm just going to list those here for you too. They're a little bit easier to remember. There you go. So initially, we were able to put together a program that we could launch for that $500 grant. And that's what we were going to have to uh, start with. We have a question here about what exactly the overall cost was. Um, so that initial very, very basic entry level was at about, about $500 and that's fairly, fairly good for a 13 branch system. Uh, I don't think we would have been able to launch it for any less than that. In the end, we did receive some fairly substantial grants and some additional funding from the city. So it did end up being a few thousand dollars to launch the, the initial run. And I want to say now it's in the budget for more like five or six thousand dollars a year. And as far as success, we really just counted uh, each level that children turned in, each hundred books as part of our success. We kept it recorded when they would come in and turn in their, their reading log. Uh, finishing the whole program was, of course, the goal, but our primary focus was on getting parents to read more at home. So we had, we had different levels that we, we considered. We recorded the number of registrations that we, we had, and that was part of our, our metrics that we kept each 100 book level that we met, and then definitely how many people finished. Those are some really great questions. Was there anything else? So for the children that finished, how many prizes did they receive? So they received that initial registration packet, which was the book bag, an easy reader, and the reading log, and then instructions on how to read to your child. And then, they received a sticker for every 100 levels, so they received a total of 10 stickers throughout the program. And then they received bubbles at 200 books, sidewalk chalk at 400 books, Play-Doh at 600 books, and that nursery rhyme CD at 800 books, and at 1,000 books, then they received their great big um, book that they got to take home. But I think that it could be adapted very easily to not include those smaller prizes uh, in between. We just, we had the funding and really wanted to encourage parents to keep coming in. I also found that when I, when I transferred out to the smaller branch, I was able to more engage with parents and children in the area. One of the big prizes for them was moving that star up the wall. It, it was probably a bigger factor than that little bottle of bubbles they got. Uh, 
we we worked with Read Squared on our app. There was a question about building the app in house. Uh, we worked with Read Squared pretty closely. They were pretty uh, pretty willing to work with us and put something together. They hadn't done anything like that before. When we when we first approached them, they'd never done a thousand books program or something that was quite so year round. So there was a lot of back and forth with our our in-house person who was in charge of uh, of technology and the read squared program uh, programmers but uh, she was able to to put something together and it worked pretty well uh, i used the thousand books app that is based off of, that is at the thousandbooks.org website that you can download that one worked fairly well for me i know that some people struggle with that one as well uh, most parents didn't want to use the app. It, it was a good thing to offer for those people that do like to record their books that way, but it, it wasn't something that, that we saw a huge success with. If you were setting this up again, would you go paper logs only or would you provide both digital and paper options? I think I would provide both if the option was available. In our case, we were already subscribing to Read Squared and it didn't cost us any additional money to provide both options. But if for budgetary reasons we needed to choose one, I would choose the paper log because that seemed to be an easier way for parents to record what they were reading. In, in my case, we read a lot away from home. We would go to the public library and read, or we'd be sitting at my mother's house and reading. So I liked having the app available so that I could record that reading when I wasn't in the same room as the reading log. But a lot of parents said it was just as easy for them to take a snapshot of the cover and go home and write it down in the log or to, to just only record the books that they were reading at home. Uh, and that worked for them. I think a lot of it depends on your community too and how much accessibility they have to things like a smartphone. Uh, we do have a pretty wide range of socioeconomic levels in the community here and so it was nice to have the paper option because if you didn't have access to a smartphone you could still do the reading program. Those are some really great questions. Well, I am, I am more than happy to talk about this. This is one of those passion things that I love talking about. It was such an important thing to me to bring more reading home to parents. So if you have any more questions and would like to send me an email, uh, you can reach me at e, e Hoffma, it's H-O-F-F-M-A-1 at emporia.edu. Uh, you can certainly find me on our Emporia website as well, and I would love to let you know more about my experiences, and I've just chatted out my email address so that, that you have access to that. So thank you so much for joining us today, and, and I wish you all lots of luck with your reading programs. <laughs>